Okay. So um, let me just uh, pause now. Um, the person who's been talking to you um, is uh, Anthony Scoggins. I'm director of programs at the Cody International Institute. Uh, and I'm going to be co-facilitating today's session with, uh, with Aster. Aster, why don't you introduce yourself? I am, there is a new project uh, in which WISE got from CODI this year. Uh, Engage, I am coordinating that project. And I'm a graduate of uh, uh, action research uh, in CODI and also women's leadership. So, thanks. Welcome, Aster. Okay. So, uh, between the two of us, we'll uh, work us through today's program. Um, I was hoping that Gord Cunningham, uh, our executive director, would be online. I don't think he is at the moment. I know they had another call at the university. And I'm he here. Oh, he is here. All right, Gord, go ahead. Speak up. Good morning, uh, colleague, Cody colleagues. Good afternoon, Ethiopian colleagues. Um, it's wonderful to see you all and uh, to be able to hear you all. Uh, this is... Uh, these are unprecedented times, and I've been thinking a lot about you. Um, Ethiopia is near and dear to my heart. It was one of the first countries I started working when I came to Cody. 20, my first trip to Ethiopia was in 2000. And, um, I, and, and, and what, what we're doing today, and Anthony you know, has touched on it, is we're doing a series of reaching out to partners and alumni to really get a sense of how they're doing. Uh, partly to just make sure we maintain connection because while social or physical distancing is what is required in a pandemic, social distancing is not. We need to be more socially connected than ever before. We, we want to find out how you're doing and we want to be informed by you in terms of how you're dealing with the pandemic. You know, what are some of the impacts? What are the responses, particularly in my own view, asset-based and citizen-led responses? Um, because this intelligence that we can all gather together through sharing will, will help all of us and will certainly help Cody as we, as we look forward to upcoming courses to try to make them more relevant to life in a post-COVID world, which is going to be maybe a new normal. So um, I thank Anthony and Aster for hosting this. Um, we have done several other uh, webinars. I think this is the fourth or fifth. We, this is the second country-based uh, cohort in which we've uh, we've tried to organize. There's been one on livelihoods and markets or inclusive economies led by our colleague Yogesh and uh, colleagues Yogesh and Farouk. Um, there was a country-based uh, webinar in Nepal. Uh, we had a women's, we were led off by Eileen and her team on women's leadership and uh, we've also um, had the diploma class of 2018 yesterday. So I may have, I think I may have missed one on participatory governance that was led by Julian, and I'm not sure exactly what that was, so I'm sorry, Anthony. Anyway, this is really important. I'm really glad to see you all there. Um, I hope you're well. I want to hear from you, so I'll stop talking. And I just want to say um, that when I think of Ethiopia, and I think of traditions that would stand you well in a pandemic. I think of the hand washing culture, the traditional culture of hand washing that I encountered in 2000 when I first came to Ethiopia. And it is still, after visiting probably 40 different countries, maybe 50 with Cody, I don't think I've seen a, a country in which hand washing has been so ingrained in a cultural sense. And I, and I think that's probably an asset that you have. Um, anyway, uh, I'll leave it at that. And thank you again, Anthony and Aster and everyone on this call. And I, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Gord. Um, okay, Aster, over to you. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, our conversation, whoa, I couldn't see the slide. <laughs> yeah, sorry, they, they bounce a bit. Uh, yeah. no. There we go. Oh, too far. <laughs> yeah. Our conversation today is now uh, we are in a time of pandemic. Cody alumni and their organizations are looking for and finding ways to support communities of the vulnerable and disadvantaged to respond to this crisis. Today's conversation is an opportunity for the diploma grads of 2018 
to reconvene, to share ideas and experiences, questions and challenges, as how uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting our different communities and organizations and how they are uh, responding. This is the major uh, issue. Uh, as you remember, uh, it was uh, in December that this COVID-19 appears in China. And after three months, nearly uh, in March 13, the first COVID-19 cases appeared uh, in Ethiopia. And so far, uh, really, a lot of measures has been taken by the government, by the, the local community, by private entrepreneurs. Major actions have been taken. Uh, I could say that uh, the government is taking the lead immediately. Uh, I, I remember it was on Friday that the first cases were uh, heard. And on Monday, it was an announcement at, in midday that all closed, all schools are closed. There is an announcement to close all schools. And from that day onwards, every day, uh, there are new progresses, the government leading the role. As the meantime, immediately the next day after we heard the first case, it was a fundraising event organized by the, uh, uh, by the prime minister. From that day onwards, the government is encouraging every, uh, community, every organization, every agency to take uh, uh, preventive measures and to show solidarity to each other. So that I could say that this is the first time that all the politicians, uh, the private sector, and all the community members are working hand in hand to deal on the prevention and to supporting each other. So far, uh, around 131 cases are heard. And uh, only three days out of those 131, around 58 are recovered. As you heard, uh, there is no uh, 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 airplane transportation. Maybe the future challenge may be because our neighbors are slightly uh, being affected now. Those who are crossing by walking the boundaries may uh, affect Ethiopia in the near future. Uh, after I said this, I could leave uh, the floor to uh, uh, to Anthony to bring him to the next session. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Astor, and I I, uh, I apologize. It's the danger of um, cutting and pasting uh, uh, slides. That slide was from yesterday's um, uh, program and spoke to the diploma class of eight, uh, 2018. This, of course, we're talking to the uh, Cody alumni of, of of Ethiopia. But thanks for that, uh, Browner uh, Astor, on uh, the situation in Ethiopia. Uh, what we uh, would like uh, to focus our conversation on today is really. So what does a community-driven response uh, look like uh, to the pandemic? So what are our organizations, what are our communities doing? How are they responding? Uh, and I, I, I want to acknowledge that in our conversations to date with other uh, cohorts and other groups, uh, there, are, there are two quite different elements of this, one of which is uh, the response to the health crisis, which is the uh, pandemic. Uh, the risk of, um, of contagion and uh, infection and the virus and dealing with all those issues. And the other one, to be perfectly honest, is response to the, um, to the lockdowns or the uh, government policies and the restrictions on movement and, and so forth that have followed, which in many countries, in many contexts, have had a much more, at least in the short term, much more complicated and challenging impact on communities than the, uh, the virus it, it itself, uh, at least to this point. So anyhow, what we'd like to do is to look at uh, what are your organizations doing from a community-based approach. And we have a series of questions here we'd just like to run through the types of issues that we've heard about from other um, partners and, and countries. Um, uh, so uh, Astrid, do you want to speak to this one on community engagement? Maybe uh, let me invite Sike first, and then I can fill the gaps because she's prepared on that to as a guest speaker. Sike. Hello, Sike, can you hear yes. me? Yes, yeah, okay. yes, I can. Take the floor, okay. Yeah, yes, I can, okay. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I hope you're doing well. Uh, good to see you. 
uh, Ward, Brian, and, and uh, everybody else. Uh, with uh, respect to, uh, uh, as Aster um, earlier said, the government is uh, taking uh, very proactive, you know, uh, pro very proactive measures so far in, uh, you know, building the health system capacity in uh, awareness creation and, and the like, and uh, different measures for creating distancing um, including, you know, the issuing a state of uh, emergency, but uh, some of the good, um, you know, uh, measures or directives uh, out there is, for instance, no uh, organization can lay off employees. That is is forbidden. Uh, even for schools, schools, private schools have to pay, you know, uh, the salaries of. Uh, uh, their teachers and uh, parents have to pay 75% uh, of the school fees for these you know, months, for the remaining months. And uh, um, this is a very, uh, you know, uh, very good um, action uh, so that, you know, uh, the community or the employees are secured of their jobs, at least those in the, in the formal sector. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, one of the other directives is to curb the uh, number of cars moving in, in the city. So now it's uh, at least half of the private vehicles uh, are out of the roads, you know, uh, every day. You know, the, it's, uh, they can move by turn, so it's uh, by plate number, even and odd. And uh, also, you know, the public transportation, they, they can only, uh, uh, you know, accommodate half of their capacity. So this, this helps. Well, despite all these, uh, there are, you know, uh, you, you see, you see, we see reluctance among, you know, some community uh, members. But anyway, I think it could be, uh, uh, this could be due to the slow growth of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the virus uh, in in the country. Not uh, I cannot say the virus because uh, not every not not many people have been tested. I think only you know in less than ten ten thousand people have only been tested, and most of them are people who come from abroad. So that, that's why we have only in, in the 130 something uh, confirmed cases. Uh, on the part of um, uh, communities, that's what uh, you know, the, the question says. Uh, in terms of public awareness and education, uh, different groups of communities, like you know, the artists, the youth, the uh, religious uh, institutions, CBOs, you know, and and uh, you know, mm, groups of uh, you know neighborhoods, you know, they have been very uh, active in uh, creating awareness, public awareness, but not only awareness, but also supporting uh, communities or the needy, the very destitute, with. Uh, food and sanitary uh, supplies. The artists, artists are, you know, are very much occupied with producing songs and dramas to create awareness. And the youth are very much into collecting and distributing food and sanitation items to, uh, you know, the needy uh, uh, population. And uh, in addition to that, the religious institutions, people in, you know, in different religious institutions are also contributing and distributing food to the needy and also distributing messages to their members to create uh, aware, awareness. This is happening every day and very, very aggressively. Community-based organizations that are in existence and that 
are also you know be, uh, being formed you know uh, during this period are distributing also food and creating awareness in different forms like you know small small uh, you know stores firms households and all you know everybody is uh, trying to avail hand washing facilities you know outside their homes so that uh, or or in the, you know crowded areas so that people can wash their uh, their hands these are the community um, initiatives you know that we have i'll talk about you know the community initiatives within wise maybe at a later stage when we talk about what our organizations doing you know okay that's it that's there I'm through us there. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. Uh, let, me, let me build on what uh, Sege has said. Uh, especially on public awareness and uh, education, there is a concerted planned prevention techniques. Uh, there is a free of charge called by Ethio Telecom from the Ministry of Health. SMS messages are released every now and then, whenever, uh, uh, every time. And this free of charge, uh, there is also a call center whenever uh, we, ha we heard of uh, the danger, we can report to that. Especially when someone dials uh, to his friend or to his family, these messages, the prevention techniques that are uh, uh, prepared by the Ministry of uh, Health are released or comes to the uh, audience or to the caller every time in addition to the SM message. And as the case said, all religious groups, uh, they have their own awareness program. They have uh, a prayer time to boost the moral of the people. And in different topics, they are encouraging and uh, not only uh, uh, to follow the religious rules, but also, uh, you know, Ethiopia, as you know, in, be it uh, Islamic or uh, Christian, there are a lot of believers and they say that, oh, oh, no problem, God knows. But they are advising every now and then abide the religious rules as well as the message transmitted by the government. So religious uh, groups, uh, really, they play uh, uh, an, a very important role. They educate as well as they uh, try to boost the moral of uh, the, the people, not to be uh, really... Uh, to be demolarized by the situation created. And uh, the other one is our TVs and radio programs, uh, even the, the religious uh, meetings are transmitted through various language. Maybe for, for the first time, uh, all religious institutions are using a lot of language uh, in radio and in TV uh, program, including the private, even the activists. Initially, the activists, other than they don't know, they prefer uh, or talk always on politics. But this time, the government is, because there is a call from the government, everybody to engage and to curb this pandemic. So the TV programs of the activists are also uh, used uh, to educate and sensitize the community. A very interesting thing about the, activ uh, the artists is there is a drama, songs, and motivational uh, speech by celebrities and known people, uh, and even by walking around their co the community, specific communities, they walk around, they took a car, walk around, and they sensitize, and also exercise the hand washing. When it comes to health sanitation and uh, well-being, uh, there is a distribution or donation of these sanitary materials by the government, by the NGOs, by the private sector, by individuals, sector and institutions as well. Uh, there is also innovation by, by use. For example, uh, you know, there are some innovations that started to appear. Also, the, the government is encouraging those innovations. Of, uh, they used to be innovative in order to contribute to curbing this pandemic. Uh, equipment with a sensor that releases water every 20 seconds are uh, 
uh, really uh, on air and we show uh, th uh, these are important, you know, they uh, are encouraging us to wash our hands at least for 20 seconds so that the, the water flows for 20 seconds uh, and it is a sensor. Another innovation is a leg pressing, leg, uh, a hand washing tool in which you use by pressing using uh, your leg. This is to avoid uh, contamination. The other uh, thing is uh, in relation to health sanitation and well-being is there is a shift in production. You know, those uh, small factories who, that produce alcohol start producing a lot of sanitizers. Uh, and also uh, even our own uh, small entrepreneurs, uh, our garment workers, they started producing face masks, which is a very important and innovative aspect. And some of our members are also giving these uh, masks free of charge to uh, uh, community members. The other uh, important thing related to health, sanitation, and well-being is every Ethiopian is asked to contribute what they have to curb the pandemic. You know, this is a time where Really, the corporate social responsibility, especially from the private sector, is highly or remarkably observed. Some give their buildings so that uh, if uh, uh, the cases are increasing, it can be used as a bedroom and uh, to support the people. And some uh, pro uh, provide uh, uh, a lot of money, individuals as well as uh, Inter, uh, in institutions and private entrepreneurs. They are donating, their bank accounts are uh, provided uh, through the different uh, branches, Ethiopian uh, Commercial Bank and all the different branches. So people are donating individuals, institutions, private uh, sectors. So uh, the other one is rather than, in some cases, rather than uh, uh, putting the money into the government, uh, into the account given, even direct support is also given to some vulnerable groups. And uh, a very interesting thing, uh, something which uh, attracts my attention is also, a government also uh, uh, sent a circular to judiciary bodies to take immediate action on perpetrators, especially related to the domestic violence. This is how this shows about uh, our uh, government uh, initiative to support the community. And still, there are uh, some initiations. The, uh, the decision, we, we were expecting the decisions to pass very soon. There is a tax exemption or a reduction by the uh, government. We are waiting for that. And the government is also, I'm talking about this food security and the economic livelihood. You know, at this time, there, there is no active, uh, uh, active business, I could say. And most of those, uh, especially the middle level entrepreneurs are uh, hiring their shops from a bigger one. So the government is urging to reduce the house rent or exemption and uh, some uh, some people officially announced a two months, a one month uh, rent exemption for those uh, people hiring uh, hiring their uh, shops. The other one is the first thing done by the government is the government try to control those who escalate the, the price of goods, and they were some of them are taken measures and people are encouraged to report on those issues and immediately the government take uh, actions. So these are some of the issues. Maybe if Sister Sinkanesh, uh, Sister Sinkanesh, uh, I heard, uh, I saw that she joined, joined the meeting. If Oscar, she has something to say. Sorry, Oscar, uh, I think what we're gonna try to do is just go through the other, quickly through the other slides so that we can then open it up to Sinkanesh and, okay. and others. Would that be okay? Okay, yeah. okay, good. Anthony? All right, thank you, Eileen. So yeah, so I think what we just want to do is to run through um, uh, Siggy and uh, uh, 
asked to have given us a good overview of some of the many different things. We looked at community engagement. Uh, then there's the issue about focusing on the most vulnerable uh, in terms of how do we try to make sure that um, uh, vulnerable groups, um, are, uh, uh, their needs are, are met and that they're engaged and uh, benefit from this, and whether that's women and children, the aged, the infirm, the disabled, the economically marginalized, the socially uh, exploited or oppressed, all, uh, you know, what are we doing to try to focus on those most vulnerable groups? Uh, next, Eileen, I'll just run through these quickly. Um, there are a number of organizations that have started to look at, okay, this is a learning moment. I mean, yes, there, it's a, almost a humanitarian um, uh, crisis in, in some sense, but it's also a moment where we can learn from what's working and what's not working. And so there are different groups engaged and it's more difficult to do community level research now, obviously because of social distancing and, and uh, constraints on, uh, on movement. Um, but uh, a lot of research being done there. And, and also, uh, as Aster mentioned, there are many, many different government actions that are taking place. And in many cases, uh, community-based organizations and NGOs are trying to um, engage with uh, and influence some of these decisions if they feel that there are gaps or that they're inappropriate or that they're problematic in one way or another. Um, uh, and, and these could be either on issues of, of some of the food support or on gender-based violence or, or whatever, but there are a number of different uh, opportunities for, by which uh, NGOs and, and community-based organizations can uh, engage with uh, government on policy issues. Um, and then finally, uh, and, and we don't want to, it's not all about us at NGOs and CBOs, but certainly this crisis has a lot of implications for uh, our own work. And so even here at the Cody, we see in terms of we've had to cancel our full summer program of courses. We're trying to rethink how do we do um, our training, does it, uh, you know, and, and, and our whole programmatic approach if it in, requires um, uh, lesser international travel, um, uh, one uh, one direction or the other. So, uh, and what does this mean for our own bottom lines and our own viability and sustainability as organizations if projects are not being uh, rolled out and implemented? So, um, and so there are a whole series of questions there around how we as organizations try to respond in a um, uh, in a way that meets the needs of the future. Uh, so I think those are the set, sort of sets of questions. So what we'd like to do now is open up the floor. I'm going to hand it back to um, the, the moderator, back to Aster, um, but basically then uh, to move back into the meeting format and just to really ask uh, the, the open-ended question, in what ways has your organization or you and your communities been responding to this crisis? Um, and uh, are there particular lessons learned that you would like to share uh, in that experience. So Eileen, if we can flip over to the meeting format. There we go, everybody. So we can see each other, um, those of you who have video. Uh, and I'll hand it back to Aster for, for this, uh, the, the remaining part of the conversation. Yeah, uh, as you see, the question is, how does our, each of our organizations respond to these uh, questions? Uh, I will give uh, the floor to Sergei first, followed by Sister Sukhanesh. Short and precise. Okay, Sergei is on mute mode. Okay, open. Okay, Sergei, on mute mode, opening. You, you can't hear me? Yes, now. Okay. 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 Are, okay. We, we are trying to be, um, um, you know, um, proactive in a number of ways uh, in order to, you know, save lives, you know, uh, avoid, try to avoid, you know, hunger, especially among our members, and also try to save the institutions of the members, the, the SACOs. Maybe at this stage, the lives of the SACOs may not be very, I mean, it may not be a very critical, uh, you know, issue at this point, but in the coming months, if, you know, the women are affected, the institutions are affected. 
So if the women are not able to save and to you know, pay back their loans, the institutions cannot uh, continue when this pandemic is uh, over. That will be very, a very critical point. So we are trying to see uh, things on three levels, saving lives, uh, and ensuring food security or avoiding hunger and saving the institutions. Uh, through this, we, we have uh, you know, acted on staff first. We have reduced the staff uh, who come to the office. Some come on shift basis, some, uh, you know, a few who are working from home. And uh, um, and some are you know uh, working on ba backlogs etc. And we have tried to create awareness through posters, sharing of information, distribution of sanitizers and face masks to our staff members. And uh, uh, with uh, regard to community, we are trying to keep connected through phone calls. That is the technology that we can use when it comes to you know, uh, connecting with the community. So we aim to reach the majority of our members around, you know, we have around eight, 18,000 at the moment. Uh, so staff have uh, divided themselves into you know, the different circles and they contact the leaders, the leaders, the, uh, the chairpersons, the chairpersons contact the committee uh, members, the committee, contact the group members in the group, you know, uh, the group leaders contact the uh, members of the group. So it's a, like a pyramid. So in that way, we attempt to get connected, to keep connected with the, uh, the community members. And we also try to need those who are in need of psychosocial services, because at this moment, as it's said everywhere, domestic violence may emerge uh, and also, it's, li it's likely to, to happen, you know, in many households. Even though we do not have a total lockdown, there are, you know, tensions within within the house. The children are there, you know, some uh, some uh, husbands may not be working, and so on. And also, single mothers are likely to be in a depression due to, you know, inability to... Uh, to cover expenses, especially food expenses in the household. So we try to uh, get connected with such uh, people. And we also plan to provide, uh, now we are uh, you know, uh, assessing the needs, business counseling to, you know, through trainers, to those who cannot uh, run their businesses due to the pandemic like uh, uh, cafeteria owners, people who sell food items, okay, prepared food, uh, weavers, uh, and also tailors. You know, these people uh, are very much affected and they are not pay, pay, you know, they are not, they are not able to pay back their loans. And some, of course, as Aster said, have switched, you know, like the trainers, the tra tailors have switched their businesses into face mask production, so they, they 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 can they can survive you know for some time, and we also plan to give grace period you know the the communities will will uh, I mean the members will have a grace grace period for loan uh, repayment, and uh, the, we are also uh, assessing the situation of the. Uh, most vulnerable population, like women living in, uh, with uh, HIV AIDS. We have a group, you know, that we call a health, health group. These are around 250 uh, women who live with, uh, with the virus, and we are offering them counseling and also sanitary uh, supplies and food items, you know. Uh, and, uh, we, you know, we, we try to engage the leaders so that you know uh, actions are taken by the community you know by the women themselves so they they, they are very much engaged in these uh, activities that's in terms of you know what we are doing uh, with respect to the to the pandemic to address issues of staffing issues of community 
members. And we are, in fact, currently um, receiving very encouraging you know, uh, news from most of the, the women. The women, they say, oh, we'll try to, now we are okay. We'll try to survive. And you know, this is what they are saying. And instead of, oh, no, 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 the world, the world has you know, uh, fallen down upon us. And no. So this is, a, this is a strength. This is a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it shows how, how resilient you know, the women are. So that's in short, you know, what uh, we've been uh, uh, trying to do, you know, within the community or the community members are trying to do. Okay, thank you, Sinke. Uh, I saw a different face. The name is uh, Sinkenesh, but a different face. Sister Sinkenesh, uh, will you tell us your name and uh, uh, try to tell us your initiative, what you are trying to do to curb the pandemic? Sinkenesh? Hmm? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, yes, I am Sinkanesh from Nairobi. Yeah. Uh, very, very nice to see uh, Ellen and all of the colleagues. I am, uh, yeah, the change leaders uh, alumni of Quadi 2015, so long. But I'm happy that I'm keep connected to the um, uh, Quadi work. Um, I can bring two, two perspectives to this discussion. Uh, one is a regional one from the West Indian Ocean, uh, where Ethiopia is not a member, but I'm leading a program for 10 countries on um, ecosystem management and sustainable development. As Ethiopian, also my heart and my work is back home. Uh, uh, I am very happy that Aster and Zge, you have presented very ex exclusively what is happening back home. We are trying our best to keep our community protected from the epidemic as well as also to reduce the impact, the economic impact of the, the pandemic. So um, I want to try to connect how we're doing uh, in our current job, uh, using our uh, quality leadership training and what is happening, especially in the current situation at global level. Uh, I, I want to, to mention Baki, Baki uh, from Ethiopia. Uh, we are um, at UN, there are a number of international staff uh, from UN, we have a network, we are contributing resources, we are supporting the government and the national initiative. Personally, we, uh, we belong to family, we belong to churches, we are trying our best. And um, uh, as Aster mentioned, it's a, a leadership from the government uh, higher level to down to the private sector, to the community, and also at the religion uh, level. So. We're, we're trying our best, though it's not enough. Uh, we have to do a lot. From my work, uh, I am environmentalist, and my work is uh, the coastal and the marine ecosystem conservation. Since my country doesn't have a, a coast, we, Ethiopia is not a member, but uh, I'm working for 10 countries. So what we're doing in Kenya and other 10 countries, five of them are island, uh, we, we used to have a sustainable management of ecosystem integrated with livelihood. Uh, because of the pandemic, uh, now we are forced to shift some of the resources. And what we see is as a program, we don't have uh, contingency planning. We didn't plan for this epidemic as well as for other disaster. So the, the biggest learning point is contingency planning is very important in sustainable development work. So we have uh, discussed with governments uh, in most of the 10 countries. So uh, we, we shift some of the resources uh, to support the to curb the pandemic spread, as well as to support our vulnerable community in terms of providing their um, food livelihoods and also not to stop any of the sustainable development work. And from the United Nations Environment Program side, we think uh, this virus and some of the related come from human beings encroaching to the uh, ecosystem. We are destroying the ecosystem. Some of the virus like uh, this one, though it needs intensive training, um, research, we think that human beings are destroying the ecosystem, the environment, and we are getting close to live with the wild animals. So the disease, we are getting some of the disease like Ebola and others, they are coming from wild animals because we are destroying their home, their ecosystem, their habitat. So from our side, we are working on policy, how we can influence governments 
to work human beings to not to encroach and to destroy um, the ecosystem. And also the issue of climate change sh should be mentioned here. Uh, so uh, for that purpose, we are working on policy research as well as we have opened an Earth School is an uh, online platform to help the community and especially uh, as we have like one, more than 1.2 billion children are away from school, we want to reach the society so that they can have awareness raising uh, on the issue related to uh, ecosystem health and the human health. So uh, I'm talking very yeah, extensive talk, not very focused in one community. But thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Okay, thank you, Senator uh, I would like to give also the chance to Kifle from Siderta. Uh, Siderta is supporting one of the vulnerable groups. They have uh, an institutional care. How does the pandemic affect you? What are you doing? And how do you uh, try to curb the situation not affecting your community? Kifle. OK, thank you. Are you listening to me? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Nice to see you too. Uh, and also, I would like to forward my thankfulness for Cody for bringing us all to the board on this puzzling time. It is a nice opportunity. Saying so, uh, we are working currently on uh, two kinds of projects. One is uh, outreach program, a training of women heads uh, and training of users. Uh, now such programs are temporarily quitted because uh, the likely programs in every uh, uh, sector are uh, already decided by the government to stay at home. For the users, the trainers created platform for sharing information and also to provide some kind of uh, you know training like uh, life skill training. Uh, the other kind of project we have is industrial care project. For orphan children living with HIV AIDS and also children who have been living on the streets. Both of them are very challenging. So we are, uh, uh, the first thing we, we did is we used our staffs. We have uh, professional staffs like heads, uh, professionals, nurses, and using our networks with other institutions like hospitals. Uh, we created awareness on both uh, institutions first. Then in the institution, the, the beneficiaries are uh, uh, kept indoors, they are not going out. They are not going out. And we are trying our best to protect from uh, them from the pandemic. We have our staffs. Some of them, we, we try to uh, help them to stay at the center. Because if they are coming and back every day, the chance of you know the uh, infection will be high. There are some staffs they can't stay at the project because of their individual uh, um, business. So for them, uh, of course, we can't provide every, for everyone a service at at home because the the space is limited. Previously, it was not made like that. So some staffs go in the back. And what we are trying to make is as much as possible to, to protect the children uh, from the infection. So what they are doing is uh, they have two, two kinds of clauses, 
two, two sets of clauses. One, they will put it in the institute. And when they are coming from outside, they change their clothes. They use masks, gloves, and they, they, they wash their hands. There is no contact between the beneficiary and the, 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 the staffs. Uh, uh, for uh, street children, we have a big challenge there because they have been free outside, walking everywhere, talking everything, and doing everything outside. When you keep them in the institutes and closed indoors, uh, really there is uh, very challenging. So we need to create many recreational opportunities. To do so, we, we need people to come in. So for that, we do the same thing we, to protect them. There are volunteers who uh, help us uh, creating you know, entertainment opportunities like circus, uh, music, dance, like that. And also health, health education. We have indoors um, uh, games like ta table tennis, uh, like that. Uh, we also uh, availed uh, sanitation uh, materials, hand washing basin, and everything. Every time they are helped to wash their hands. That is what we are trying to make, but such, such uh, activities, uh, you know, uh, led us to, to uh, cost more than we have planned. And when they are staying at home every time, the consumption also has increased. Uh, so to, to, to fill the gap, we are actually uh, trying to mobilize uh, resources. Some of the government sectors are also trying to support us, back up us. Uh, we have every time information exchange between concerned government sectors. Uh, and when we have gaps, they are trying to fill it, but still it is uh, growing. Uh, on the three children part, currently there is a, a, a request to go back to their home. To, to re, re, reunify with their family. But the situation and the policy by the government is, uh, is not allowing as such to the movement of people from one corner to another, but uh, we are trying to communicate with regional governments and the sectors uh, to arrange such uh, programs because it's good if they are really able to back to their home and reunify with their family. That is what we are doing it mainly. Okay, thank you, uh, Kifle. Uh, I'm really thinking to connect uh, Sion from Catholic Relief. She's trying to connect repeatedly, but now uh, it failed. Maybe we can give the chance to other participants to any volunteer, they can raise their hands and they can build the discussion. Can you hear me? So Ephraim, Ephraim has his hand up, so maybe Ephraim can go next. Actually, um, the, the term was to Sion Belda from- Oh, so sorry, sorry, I, I thought you said she wasn't getting on. Sorry about that. Yes, no, yeah. So to the next schedule then. Sion, are you there? Can you hear us? No, she don't have a connection. She's okay. trying, but can't. yeah. Can we invite anybody interested? Can you hear me? The rest yes. of you. So if Ephraim has his hand up, um, Aster, do you want do you want him to go next? No, maybe uh, Anthony can take the the, the chance. Uh, if not. Mm -hmm. No, I'm 
we're uh, we're doing fine. So if if there's if uh, um, if we're waiting for somebody to try and connect, I'd say we go with uh, Ephraim or whatever. We have time for a couple more um, presentations. Um, Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. So now I proceed, Ali. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you very much indeed, and good afternoon for the Ethiopian and good morning for the, the Cody Cody out there. So I'm not from speaking on behalf of the Dutch Christian Foundation called World in That. So World in That, along with its, its Ethiopian partner, has been implementing a five-year program called Employability in Ethiopia. And this program has been trying to address the root cause of irregular and illegal migration across the southern corridor by bringing state and non-state actors on board. So as you can imagine, the target groups of this program are more mainly young women and girls, which have been seriously affected by the pandemic that we are, we are speaking today. So as part of uh, a reactive coping to it, we have tried to do some solidarity work by mobilizing the community, the government line offices, and also the member of the consortium that I'm managing. They are in total eight, so and scattered around across the southern corridor of Ethiopia. So, so far, we have been able to provide some sort of sanitary materials, especially for the destitute and the vulnerable and the marginalized section of society, both in Addis and also across the southern corridor. And we also did some, some awareness creation campaign by mobilizing volunteers to do a hand washing campaign in the many cities of Addis Ababa and also try to provide some, some sort of food items, provisions, especially for those who cannot be able to, do, to manage that by their own during this time of crisis, because some of them are, are doing daily laborers, some of them are you know, attending TV trainings, which they couldn't manage to continue due to the fact that has been explained by many colleagues in this afternoon. So some are doing it like, you know, contribution, financial contribution to the government, you know, National, there are nine national resource mobilization task force established by the Ethiopian government. So some are mobilizing, you know, financial and non-financial resources to the Ethiopian government at a national level so that that can be used in, a, in, a, in any efficient way possible. And as the program, as the very nature of the program, we see more role to, to our program in the aftermath of the pandemic than, than emergency response in, in the current situation. A cognizant of this fact, we have communicated with the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is a backdoor to the program that, that I'm managing to, to, to give us a bit of room of maneuver to shift some of, some of the resources to emergency response, for which we get a kind of blessing from them. And now the partners are somehow reshuffling some of the activities to do some, some form of emergency response. Also, we see more role to our service during the, the aftermath of the pandemic than in the emergency response, which is the very nature of the program that we are managing. But some of the partners with the likes of like Digital Opportunity Trust are trying to move some of the manual training to, to a digital platform so that the youngsters can, can attend still their training in life skill, business skill, in the, in the context of the pandemic. And we are also mobilizing some, some funding from abroad. As my organization is based in the Netherlands, we have a a broader you know, resource base, and we have been in consultation with many actors, state and non-state actors, to get some, some, some additional funding, which can be used in the response to the pandemic. And one of the critical challenge that I can indicate as part of sustainability is that you know, although no activity has been, has been accomplished as we speak, but still many of the organization are incurring you know, salary and administrative costs. So, to bring that on board and to have that delicate balance is found to be very challenging. So for that, we are really mobilizing additional resources from additional donors to, to compensate that, that, that financial deficit that we might have by, by the end of the program. So this has been some of the things that we are doing. So to convince the donor and also to keep them on track on what's happening on the ground. So we are providing a major update to the back donors on the situation of, of, of the pandemic in Ethiopia, some of the mitigation strategies and the potential impact that might get 
on the program here in Ethiopia, but as Aster and others said, I would say as a, as a concluding remark, in my entire experience as a young Ethiopian, this is, was the first time that non-state actors and non-state actors coming together in a joint endeavors to, to have this response to this pandemic. This might be a blessing in the curse, I would say. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Fred. Maybe uh, I would like to, to share something what uh, one of our colleague sisters Sankana, from uh, social medicine, uh, from medicine center, center shared to me. Uh, at the moment, she is also uh, giving one of her uh, calls, training calls to the government. The government is using that uh, center for emergency uh, food storage site. The other interesting uh, thing shared is, you know, uh, Medan Social Center is uh, working on the most affected, especially on the leprosy affected uh, people. Uh, with the very, uh, in fact, I don't like to say it poor, but the economically, they are a very vulnerable group. So what she did was, uh, since uh, even if staying at home for a week, is, uh, it's very difficult for them. Uh, they distribute a lot of food items to such people and they have now especially to support those working in the service sector like that of washing clothes to others and in daily uh, laborers work she has a well-organized database and uh, if the pandemic uh, continues uh, she had uh, she negotiated with the donors and able to uh, develop a proposal. They, they uh, promised to support her uh, so that she prepared a proposal and planning to uh, uh, provide food and other items to such uh, vulnerable groups. And they are working hard, uh, uh, really refining their database, identifying those uh, people and trying from prevention then they are also thinking of how to, uh, to rehabilitate them and then how to bring them uh, again into work if the uh, condition ceases. This is what I have been shared from Sister Sintinas from Medical Center. Okay, thanks. Anybody would like to, would like to know also something for, from Brian or from Cody people, what are you co working around science facts? We'd like to know also. It's nice to hear. All right. Uh, um, I, none of my colleagues are going to speak up. I'll, I'll speak very quickly uh, from the point of view of, uh, of the Cody Institute. And really it is, um, uh, we're in the midst of a bit of an adaptation uh, strategy um, uh, think through, if you, if you will. We have some very short term immediate issues uh, we're dealing with here um, uh, because of the, uh, uh, and Nova Scotia, I will say by background, Nova Scotia was one of the uh, last corners of Canada to have to deal with the, uh, the virus. And so we're early on still in the, um, in the process. Um, uh, and while some parts of North America are beginning to open up, uh, it's not likely to happen here for another month or, or so. Um, uh, that said, there's, you know, we've all been in uh, social isolation, working from home. Uh, it's meant that we've had to um, uh, cancel some of our courses over the course of the summer and reschedule others into the fall. And now we are in the process of looking at what does that mean, uh, you know, what is likely now that we'll be able to do in the, in the fall, given the ongoing um, uh, constraints and issues. Um, uh, but I think our, our main uh, reflection um, is around uh, what the new normal will look like. That is to say, after COVID-19, uh, the immediate, uh, the first wave of the pandemic uh, declines, um, what will the world look like? Will, it, will we go back to the old normal or will there be um, a, a new world that we have to adapt to? And you can imagine some of the parameters of that. I mean, maybe it'll be now uh, another year or more while different parts of the world or different countries or even different regions 
uh, go through uh, ups and downs of the pandemic. Uh, I, I think we're we're told that uh, we can't reasonably expect a, a mass vaccination type of initiative for at least 18 months. Uh, so therefore, this we'll have to learn to deal with that. And then what does that mean for us in terms of as an agency that's very much involved in bringing people from away to Cody and then bringing, uh, taking Cody people and sending them uh, overseas? Um, is, this, uh, is this going to be um, uh, problematic? And in, in, in if so, which way? So we have to learn how to do uh, some of these, um, uh, how do we, so we're in the middle of a rethink. What does this mean for our programs? What does this mean for the way we work? Um, and, and this online experience is, is very much part of the, uh, uh, the first thinking through of that. I mean, uh, online courses obviously are one way to go. Uh, a number of our partners in the Engage program have expressed interest in learning more about how you do online training and so on. So that may be an area of capacity development we'll build in. Uh, but more importantly, I think, so that's at the operational level, uh, at the um, critical thinking level is trying to think, what does this mean for development work uh, more largely? Uh, what does this uh, mean for uh, uh, communities and uh, support and development of community leadership? What does this mean for uh, women and vulnerable groups? And how does this um, present us all with new development challenges that we have to build into our work and into our teaching and into our research? Uh, so it's still early stages for us, but I think this is probably something that is going to have long-term implications for Cody and the way it works moving forward. Uh, but as such, it's still pretty much a, a work in progress or we're at the early stages yet. So uh, that's all from me. If any of my colleagues want to weigh in on that. Um, yeah. Thank you. I actually, I mean, I, I, I could go on and on about Cody, um, and there's a lot of ex exciting things that I think we're doing also on the women's leadership and Indigenous files. So the work continues, um, but obviously we're doing a lot of scenario shifting from, from one week to the next, as uh, Anthony Ford would, uh, would rightly point out. Um, there's a couple comments that have been kind of raised in the chat, and Anthony, if you don't, and ask her if you don't mind, I'll, I'll flag a couple up here. I mean, I'm thinking a lot about that big question around Ethiopia's social economic recovery. That was what Sinkinish had mentioned in the chat here. Um, um, you know, it, it seems that the, the, the current government, which has been making quite a number of strides, um, you know, will be fully tested here in how to how to continue as we move out of the pandemic moment? How do you how do you keep things strong economically? And the points that you raised earlier around, you know, at the, you know, you know, even from a membership level, whether it's through the Wise programs or other organizations that we've heard from, you know, how do you how do you make sure that the gains that have been made, um, you know, by women and men, the most vulnerable um, economically, how do those continue to be nurtured. I mean, there, that, that, that sort of, um, that huge um, uh, spectrum of economic incentives of goals need to be thought through. And then Brianne raised a question in the chat around who, what's happening at this moment with diaspora or diaspora contributions. Is that even, um, is that even something that's being um, tapped into, or are we at a moment, actually a reversal moment right now where actually the diaspora can't help you because they themselves are, you know, constrained. Mm -hmm. uh, has there been any discussion about that at all? Yes. Uh, in Ethiopia, really, the diaspora plays an important role, especially when this pandemic appears. Uh, there are activists who are really well known and trusted by the uh, people uh, abroad. So what they did was they fundraised and uh, donate a lot of money. Uh, in the, uh, besides the, uh, doing individually, there is a collective. They are collectively raising funding and sending uh, a lot of money to the country. And there is also uh, one project I think uh, also supporting uh, the, such a program, such a challenge in Ethiopia. Maybe the gay uh, can uh, add about the diaspora trust fund or something like that. Okay, can you hear? Okay. Uh, the, 
the uh, Ethiopian Diaspora Trust Fund was uh, established, I think, uh, uh, a year and a half uh, ago. And uh, uh, I think uh, some, some months ago, the total amount that was uh, collected were, was around $5 million. And uh, of it, the one, $1 million was uh, given to the National uh, Resource Mobilization Fund. And uh, uh, the rest uh, was, uh, the, the rest is earmarked for projects, you know, that uh, 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 different uh, NGOs submitted, you know, uh, proposals, uh, uh, to, to the call, to a call that the uh, Secretariat made. Uh, WISE was one and we were shortlisted. We were also in the last, uh, we, were, we were selected to be you know, one of the 21 organizations, but due to some, uh, some you know, cases created in the Secretariat and in the board, uh, I think it's it has been halted, and we're waiting for you know uh, measures or decisions by the concerned. Anyway, uh, regarding the diaspora, what uh, you know the information that I have, uh, you know, on what they did is uh, after the you know emergence of the the, the pandemic, uh, a group of people in the United States uh, raised. Um, I don't remember the figure, but uh, you know, quite a significant amount of money uh, for you know uh, people who would be uh, affected. That's all that uh, I know, uh, because I think the, the diaspora, you know, uh, themselves are affected, and uh, uh, the the secretariat or you know the government has not been very. Uh, you know, uh, has not uh, presented or approached them. Rather, what the government did is approach, you know, these big organizations like Alibaba, you know, not only for Ethiopia, but for other African countries and other big, big, uh, you know, big shots, big donors. Uh, that's, that's what, uh, you know, I know. But if uh, we see on... Um, you know, individual levels, the, there are, you know, quite millions of Ethiopian families who live on uh, disbursement or, or uh, what do you call it, the, on uh, money sent to the families. So families depend on uh, their children or their family members who live outside. So that is, in fact, you know, when we see uh, the remittances, uh, uh, you know, the, of the country, you know, it's a huge amount of money that comes from, you know, Ethiopians living abroad, sent to their own families, you know. So if when you add up that, that's a, a huge amount of money, and I'm sure they will continue to do so. That's it. Okay. And regarding just just uh, regarding you know the, this pandemic, I think you know at, I I feel that people, many people, including myself, you know, think that it's not yet, you know, fair here, because you know we we only have three deaths, and these three people had you know other ailments. And the number is not growing, and people's uh, belief is that okay, the my livelihood is more than, you know, the 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 the, the disease, you know. So they 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 they, they don't seem to accept it. However, we foresee, you know, a future when we have. The, the disease, you know, among the mass, okay, that may happen or may not happen, of course, we are, we are all not certain about it, but then it will be disastrous. 
because uh, despite you know the uh, very very you know strong measures that the government uh, has taken uh, but on the other hand uh, the, this month, especially you know, the, the past month, has been has given us an opportunity for exploring to do things differently. You know, we try to build our capacity in technology in order to connect, in order to you know reach out to uh, people, in order to communicate with our uh, partners outside the country, and also. It has given us uh, an opportunity to think of, you know, doing research or doing assessment, uh, you know, from a distance. So this, these are things that we never thought about it, and also doing things in uh, more, um, in a less less costly manner. So that is what uh, I would like to add on, you know. Uh, what has been said. Okay, thanks. Eileen, if there is no another burning question, maybe we can go to another, to the next slide. I don't know, Anthony, what do you think? Sure, I think uh, uh, unless somebody wants to jump, in, I think we're 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 ready to to wrap it up uh, for this uh, this conversation. Eileen, you want to take us quickly back to the the slides? Uh, just. Um, Uh, yeah, so I mean, basically, we just want to uh, to uh, uh, ask if there are any final uh, comments that people would like to uh, to make. I mean, we've we've covered a lot of ground, starting with the um, the, the, the national situation in Ethiopia, then moving on to uh, uh, the response of different organizations and their projects, and then coming back to conversations at the end, uh, or at least in the middle there, with specific targets, whether they were street children or, or women, um, uh, or households, uh, and then into uh, some of the other key players, the, the, the collaboration of um, state actors and non-state actors, um, the role of the diaspora and all that. So we've covered a lot of territory. Um, if there's no uh, final burning questions or whatever, I'm going to suggest we uh, we wrap it up. Uh, we wrap up this conversation. Uh, Eileen, why don't you move to the, the last slide? Uh, Okay, you've gone one too far, but all right. Okay, so uh, from our point of view here at Cody, I think what we're really uh, trying to uh, think through from a developmental sense or whatever, is this just one more humanitarian crisis? Uh, or is this a, a tipping point, a transformative moment um, in different ways in, in, the, in, the, in the world? Uh, Ethiopia has lived through a number of uh, humanitarian crises in our in our lifetime, both in terms of uh, uh, conflict, uh, drought, uh, flooding, uh, a whole range of things, and has built up a capacity to to respond to that. This one is a little different, um, and so far it sounds like um, uh, you know one's out ahead of it. But is this? just one more and in a year we'll be talking about something different or is this really a moment where because of the nature of the pandemic or the problems that it has revealed about our societies in terms of inequality, in terms of capacity of healthcare, in, in, in terms of vulnerabilities of different groups that it will actually result in changes. And those might be policy changes um, uh, uh, in terms of economics or in terms of social things, maybe human rights, it may be political, there may be um, uh, all sorts of different things. There are issues around, uh, you know, if we can't trust global uh, uh, supply chains, maybe we should be looking at more uh, local or indigenous supply chains. Um, uh, Zinikesh has raised all sorts of issues around uh, the environment, and there are a number of people talked about the connections between COVID-19, viruses, and climate change. Uh, and so all of these things are coming out and just trying to think through, you know, or will we, you know, will we move on from this? Like the world somewhat moved on from SARS or other uh, recent uh, pandemics or Ebola and saying that's something that now we know how to manage it, or will this be a, a tipping point? So that's really the question we're trying to think through in terms of our 
uh, our work as an agency and also our um, our training. Um, and uh, and it, I just will leave it to with you there. It's not all at all. Ob the answer is not at all obvious. Uh, it's a uh, it's still an open uh, open question, but we have to deal with that. So I um, I will uh, just uh, extend a word of thanks, um, uh, most particularly to um, to ask. And the uh, and the team at uh, at Wise for uh, agreeing to co-host this and co-facilitate this and um, and furthermore I'd like to uh, thank um, Eileen and Kate who provided the the technical support for this call um, uh, and I would like to um, uh, to thank uh, all of the participants who uh, who have come uh, I know some of you didn't make it in and so that's why we've recorded it and we'll uh, we'll post this and let everybody know about it um, if you have follow Oh, sure. I'm so sorry, Anthony. I just wanted to quickly interrupt you there. Um, Mulu Perhanu, who is also a Global Change Leaders um, graduate, is is also on the call. We didn't hear from her. She, um, okay. uh, I wondered if um, Mulu, if, just for one, uh, for just a brief moment, if you could say what you're up to, because you're not in Addis, are you? You're, you're uh, I can't remember the community you're in, but you're also, I think, based at the university, and I'm wondering if there's been any kind of insight from your side. It just as an add-on, sorry, Anthony, to cut you off again. Um, Are you still there, Mulu? Okay, um, so can't get her unmuted, so um, I'll maybe follow, oh, maybe I'll follow up with her after, sorry, Anthony. All right. No, no problem. Uh, don't want to. If somebody's made the effort to come all the way onto this call, we don't want to cut them out if uh, if they're there. So, uh, anyhow, as I said, um, uh, anyhow, that's uh, that's my word. Aster, would you like to say any final words before we close up? Yes. Uh, truly speaking, we uh, I forgot to mention one important thing, especially about uh, influencing public policy by CSOs and NGOs in the future. Just that. Uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, I'll take you back just for a minute. Especially uh, in the case of NGOs, uh, we need to uh, work with the government highly, especially uh, in relation to laws and regulations on corporate social responsibility. For the first time, a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, per, uh, there is uh, support from the public uh, private sector altogether. But I'm not sure whether the uh, proper laws and regulations are uh, in place related to this corporate social responsibility. If there are laws and regulations for the government to uh, support the uh, uh, entrepreneurs, there is a possibility for them also to work closely to support the poor and uh, to support also NGOs. And secondly, you know, Ethiopia is very rich in traditional knowledge. It has an assets and resources, but still we consider ourselves very poor materially. But uh, there are a lot of initiatives here and there with, uh, by the traditional, uh, uh, especially using our traditional mm -hmm. knowledge. We should, we should really uh, uh, work closely or insist the government to bring the traditional knowledge and resources together with the modern science so that uh, it is possible to conduct such joint research. This is one thing. When it comes to the last uh, remark, truly speaking, I feel that uh, it is not a humanitarian crisis, rather it is an opportunity to transform our, ourselves, our country, the way we do, the way we work with the different groups even in our organizations, even in our own thinking, because this crisis brought us all together. The world is much, much uh, interconnected. We saw how uh, a virus affected, started at one point, is affecting uh, every one of us. So this is the time to think of, uh, remove our greediness, selfishness, and uh, uh, encourage people to support each other, communities to support each other, government, uh, uh, to support each other so that rather than um, really I feel that it will bring some sort of uh, I am positive in that it will be a time for transformation to all of us from individual to community uh, at a nationwide and worldwide. 
Thanks, Simon. Well, thank you very much, Astor. I don't have anything to add to that, uh, uh, that closing note. So uh, thanks for that. Apart from saying, if people do have um, examples or case studies or documents on your COVID-19 response, I would encourage you to, uh, to send them along um, uh, to us. Uh, as you notice in the, um, uh, in the chat box, Brian Lazuri, who's our communications manager, as um, uh, inviting this, we are, you can go look at our webpage. We have of case studies or little examples of what people are doing as part of this response. And we'd love to hear more from uh, our partners and our colleagues in, uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, I see Brianne is going to, is that a question? I, I can't quite see it from here. Um, uh -huh. All right, I'm going to take that as uh, Brianne uh, promising to follow no, up. No, I'm just going to follow up with Aster. I just really appreciate her point about these parallel systems uh, in terms of uh, uh, traditional and uh, traditional and, and institutions. Uh, there's just so many parallel systems in Ethiopia, uh, formally and informally. Um, whether, yeah, like I say, traditional institutions, whether it's a strong state, whether it's NGOs. All right, so I think we just, did we just, just lose uh, Brianne, but I think uh, her point was well made uh, in terms of uh, uh, we won't solve this one uh, individually or even in, uh, 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 in isolation. Uh, we, will, uh, we will solve this um, through collaboration across the different things. So anyhow, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for joining uh, with us. Uh, we will be um, uh, sending out a, a little survey at the end so you can give, provide feedback. Uh, and then uh, we'll also be sending you the link where this um, conversation, the tape of it will be uh, available if you want to share it with, uh, with colleagues um, who may be interested in it. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for participating. Thank you in particular, Aster, for, for uh, co-facilitating this. Um, and everybody take care and, uh, and stay safe and stay healthy.